you. This is the Reverend Dr. Gilberto Rosado. Dios le bendiga. Este es Reverendo Dr. Gilberto Rosado. Welcoming you to another broadcast. At this hour, we have our bilingual uh, broadcast, our teaching in English and Spanish. So we ask that you be patient as we translate live on the fly uh, between languages. Esta es la hora que damos la enseñanza en inglés y español y pedimos que tengas eh, pues paciencia mientras que traduzcamos eh, de un idioma al otro. Aproveche y aprende el otro idioma. While we're at it, you can learn the other language as, as well. Es un beneficio de sintonizarse con nuestro ministerio. It's a benefit, an added benefit, I should add, uh, of... Uh, tuning in to our ministry. All righty, and God bless you and welcome to our next in line in the series of uh, Glossolalia or the, uh, the Pentecost and speaking in tongues. And we are going to wrap it up in this session if we can. So I'm not going to try to talk too much preamble. Just look at the previous teachings on this. I am going through the graphic that I created uh, showing you the relationships throughout the scripture uh, with this topic. So that it's more than just Acts 2. Most people think when you think about speaking in tongues they just think about acts 2 but in reality the speaking in tongues is more than acts 2 there's a lot of preamble to acts 2 and then there's a lot of postscript to acts 2 so i think we need to look at the full scope to get the full breadth of what the tongues are and what it means for the church, particularly in today's day, but also what it meant back then. I mean, what, what is God doing? It also gives you insight on how God is teaching things. Like, how are we supposed to know what the truth is? Well, look at this study just as an example, and then think to yourself, well, if God, if God is teaching this, you know, in this fashion, you know, from the Old Testament through the New, what other things, what other uh, things that we find in like in the Old Testament are also have the same character, the same uh, purpose um, in terms of the truth of God. What God is trying to show us is the truth. Why couldn't God just come out with it in the beginning? Well, why couldn't we just have TV, you know, from the get go? Things don't work that way. The human race isn't, you know, isn't just full of knowledge. When you're born, you don't know everything. So it's the same thing with the human race. We learn more and more as generations go on and on and on. So it's kind of, you know, I think a lot of people are really not good logical thinkers when it comes to God because you are, you know, you're not allowing for man. It's not an issue about God. It's an issue of man being ready. And man being able to understand certain concepts, you know, throughout history. And still today, today, 2024, most of the atheists don't understand that God is outside of existence and reality, and that's like too far to go. You can't wrap their head around it. And so, you know, what you want God to tell you the truth, but you're not ready for the truth. <laughs> it's just you're not smart enough, okay? Just accept that. You're not smart enough for the whole truth. So take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> Just go step by step, step by step. I'm here. I'm here for a little while longer. I'll be here. <laughs> and then somebody else will take over. 
But, you know, take it easy, you know, and give science a chance. It, it needs a few more generations before you start reading Genesis 1-1 and all this clarity <laughs> in your science book. Just take it easy. Again, that's not going to happen because the purpose of the Bible is in science. Remember that. Okay, but I'm just being facetious and otherwise um, poking fun at it. But as but serious in a serious manner as this is, um, you know the things are set in the way they are for the time and the context. Simple, and these things are very important. They don't solidify the truth; they simply color. They color and shape the truth for that moment. Doesn't mean that that's it. Oh, this is the way God said it for Mount Sinai, so that's it for the for the till the end of times. No, uh, not entirely. Some things, yes. In other words, the God never lied. So it's like if I gave you this teaching as little cartoons, does that mean that when I talk to you as an adult now, you know, uh, does that mean that the stuff that I showed you as a cartoon for babies, that that's not true? No, it's true. That is true. It's based on now the full stuff that I'm talking about now. But it sure doesn't look like it, right? It, it, you'll hear, it doesn't sound like it. There's a whole lot of stuff here. Right. And, and so the Bible is the same way. Babies, one way to say it, one way to have them, you know, experience it. And as the, the world matures, as the human race matures... Now we get the bigger stuff, you know, the more clearer picture. Once, you know, science has a chance to catch up and, and start, you know, the human race begins to educate, be educated. Um, and so there's going to be differences. So I find this all in all time, you know, dealing with Jews or with the Hebrews, this and that. Uh, law-keeping Christians, you, I, you, I'm, we're in the same debate. If you were in my seat, you would be feeling just like I, I do with the atheist with the same question in terms of, you know, why didn't God just say spill the beans back then? It's the same problem. And as I'm dealing with atheists with that issue, it's the same feeling that I get when I'm dealing with uh, law-keeping uh, Christians or law keeping or law keepers in general, Christian or not, that today it's the same feeling because it's the same thing. Um, the the getting stuck in the first things and not being not understanding that they they represent a greater truth and more adult thinking later on. Uh, that the culture, then the Hebrew culture at that time, and they were, they were, listen, God was teaching them big stuff. So if they would have understood everything that God was teaching through, you know, the law and, and Torah and all that, back then, oh my goodness, the world would be different. We did that in our Holy Series. And if you don't know about the Holy Series, you got to look at it. Because I, I feel I give the Hebrew um, the Hebrew people uh, the children of Israel and Jacob or Jacob I give them the highest praise I think possible I think that any Christian has ever given to um, the Hebrew um, people and those who believe in law keeping and whatnot. I mean, you can't see the Holy Series, and, and when it comes to when I'm making an analysis of what if, and if you look on YouTube, you'll see it, what if Israel had stayed faithful? It's a good question, yes. And we make this analysis throughout. It would have been fantastic, immense, immense, the impact on the world. Okay, uh, so you have to realize what, what was at stake. In, in the scripture, even with the, ch the childish manner in which uh, things developed uh, back in the day. And people still like, they look at the scripture, atheists in particular, and these are just child stories, you know. Again, not, not 
understanding that what, what you wanted to do a doctoral thesis uh, back uh, and in Moses's time it would have been you know ridiculed uh, out of the halls of uh, any type of uh, uh, serious consideration you know you guys are ridiculous you know you guys have to logically think these things through <coughs> but it's interesting how these childish stories of these uh, of this um, of the Bible of Torah are at, at the same token quite profound See, and then the atheist would do away with that profundity. No, you're, 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 uh, you know, you're putting so much into this. Oh, well, you're complaining that it's child's play at, at one thing, and now when I explain to you its application and its depth, now, now, oh, now I'm adding too much to the. Just come on. It's just you are in denial. Simple as that. You're in denial. If it was just a child story, it wouldn't make sense for an adult. It would be just silly, right? Chilly, a silly child story. There's no has no scientific uh, comparison. But unfortunately for y'all, the Bible has scientific comparisons. There, it is science in harmony with science. There's nothing in the Bible that's like disharmonic with science. It just fits. They, they are valid uh, they are concepts that are valid which means conceptually valid and that is part of what is evidence so these are these are the realities and truths that you guys have to uh, come to an understanding christian you need to under be able to defend your faith with understanding these things and i don't think the uh, 20 minute sermons on sunday is doing it for y'all these churches with these little sermons and all of that if christians are weak Totally weak. You don't know what's going on, and then and then church boards that don't uh, you know you 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 don't you're not doing the right thing. These churches are suffering out there, suffering, and you're making bad decisions. And, and then the work of God is suffering because of y'all. All right. Anyway, let's get back to this. All right, so today, let's go into... Now, the graphic has changed, ladies and gentlemen. Now, last week, we only had eight parts into this graphic. I had warned you that I may add something here. The Moses at the Mountain, I have not added as of yet because I don't think... Uh, oh, I explained it last time. What what God did with Moses was a particular uh, matter, which, although it is a revealed or or expressed in a different way with Jesus at the uh, at the um, when Jesus uh, manifest when Father the, the God manifested uh, with in front of the disciples and we'll show you that here I was fidgeting here with this uh, I wasn't going to go here but where you know the, in the transfiguration where you know it, things were made manifest to the disciples present this was you know again what happened with Moses on at the mountain with the burning bush the same thing Except there were no witnesses. There was no purpose there to show or teach a group that was gathered there. So that purpose wasn't there. So in that sense, it doesn't meet with all of the others that I have uh, shown you. Um, but there's, uh, so I still haven't put it in for that. Moses at the burning bush still has more to do with here with Matthew 17 1 than anything else and uh, even though it was the God's presence uh, on the earth with with man with Moses Moses himself represented uh, he, he was a shadow if you will a type of Messiah and he was representing the future Jesus and so therefore it's a different it's a a similar related teaching but not exactly the same 
It, the purpose was to manifest his Mashiach type, or the typology of Mashiach, and then now we see Jesus later on. But the transfiguration with Jesus is also what the whole thing is about. Even with Moses, but less so, right? Because it was more to highlight the transfiguration that will come later with Jesus. Um, but all of it really sh deserves to be in this graphic. So I, you know, soon I'm just trying to convince myself to add it to the graphic. I haven't done that yet. I don't think it's, I've done it yet right now either. But I'll keep looking at, looking at that. But what I did add was something that uh, wasn't there last week. And that was a different part of this uh, in the Bible, a different account, which is also part of the tabernacle temple situation. So that is what I'm showing you now. That addition is actually before the others. Remember that we started with the Tower of Babel uh, originally. That was our number one graphic, right? And then we did everything that followed. Well, now the first thing really, the first connection between God and man was actually in the Garden of Eden. And by the scholars identify the Garden of Eden as really its, you know, its, its language or its form uh, lends itself to temple um, practices, right? So, and so basically, the Garden of Eden was a gathering place for God and man. And so when you see that God's walking through the garden, it was a thing that, that was a habitation where God can inhabit the same area, the same holy place that man also was found there. So that's where God would commune with man, when his creature, his creation. And so in that form, uh, the Garden of Eden represents a temple, a tabernacle a tent, a habitation, okay, that, uh, God, and, and at that time, it wasn't an issue of my, like you see here, it was not a hola, her own tent in Ezekiel 23:36, right, and it was not either a, a, a holy wa, which is my tent in her, that wasn't a factor yet because Adam had not sinned yet, right? So it was just simply a pure communal space that was shared by God and by man, that God prepared this. So that's, that's the first picture, okay? Eden also was not necessarily in a, in a high place. It may have been. But there's no, not enough information to say that Eden, the Garden of Eden was high up in a mountain range or anything like that. So for now, all we can say that it was not an altar. So the temple, that temple space didn't have, so to speak, an altar. And then there was no need really for a temple, right? That need for the tent. In, in hers or mine, <laughs> you know, referring to Ezekiel twenty three thirty six. So that wasn't there. That wasn't necessary. It could have been. It may have been. You know, we can ponder. We can make uh, some philosophical uh, connections here and there. Uh, but there's no need to do that because the state did not require the state, meaning uh, the fact that Adam and Eve were yet sinless. So there was no separation. So the, the, the need for a specific temple uh, space and that is holy, so everyone has to stay out like we saw that see happens later with the tabernacle, right? And then the temple, that whole idea, you have to stay out, this is holy, you cannot be here. 
I mean, it's an echo of what happened after the sin of man, right? You can't be here. You have to leave. You have to be sent out of the garden. So that happens. So you see, it's the similar language. The similar type of language of, you know, what's happening that really ties all of that together. So it was God and man. And what was the original state? It was an original pure relationship. Original pure relationship. Man was naked, okay, for all intensive purposes. Uh, man was naked as everyone understands it today. Meaning so, and, who, and with whom are we usually naked with? Well, we're usually naked with our, the right way, okay guys, righteousness, okay, so let's stay focused here, because oh, you're going down the lists, <laughs> but we are just naked with our spouses, right, and remember that the mat mat matrimonial relationship God uses in the Bible to describe his relationship with man, so hey, this was the, uh, this was the uh, the union between God and man, and in 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 holy matrimony. So that is also.
the God of the Bible. See? And so God is saying it's in you. It's not anything you make. See? That's the Tower of Babel. But when God forms it in you, then there's no question about it. You can't be an atheist if God makes his tent in you. This is the point that I'm making. Now, all of you guys who are atheists and many Christians who are heading towards atheism, you're going to head there. It's because you are busy in your own tent uh, and you think you're pleasing God with that. You think you're, you're going to get to heaven. Yeah, it's a high tent. You know, we've been here for years and, you know, this is the traditional and all that, whatever it is. Your imagination of what makes your religion the true religion, right? All of that is what the Tower of Babel was. It was a structure. It started many time ago and it was solid and was going up and building up to the heavens. Real proof here, you know, real evidence. But it wasn't what God initiated. It's not true. It's fake. Right, and so that's that's the issue that God uh, condemned that, and it's a lesson that I don't think man has learned. I, you haven't this graphic I made myself goes why? Because you can't find it any place, right? People are not have not realized this. They've understood one part or another, but the tying it all together, you're seeing it here. It might probably it's likely likely. That is the first time in and in the public square that this this tie-in is being expressed. Because I cannot believe that in the high in academia, in the high enchilas of philosophy and, and Bible study, that no one has discussed this or made it a thesis or something like that. I can't believe that. Okay, but I, I can believe in the public arena, this low level here, that uh, this is, I think I'm the first to express this, uh, this string of relative teachings in the Bible. Okay, so in any case, this is my graphic, so I do with it what I want, right? All right, since I'm not copying it from anyone. And the pictures here are public domain, the com creative commons. Uh, but again, if anyone has a, a claim to a, a copyright for any of the images, let me know. I'll just change. I just, for expediency, most of them are from Wikipedia, Creative Commons, and uh, I think most of them from that. Otherwise, um, uh, from some other free, copyright free type of uh, websites that, that I frequent for artwork, because I am not an artist, except for music. Alrighty, so. So there you go. So that was the addition. Now the number of panels has gone from eight, the original eight, okay, and now is nine, okay? So that's what's happening now. Now nine is a significant number. So nine is an important number. Um, so it, it has meaning. Now, if we add the Moses thing, uh, the burning bush, uh, then we're going to have 10. And 10 is the number of completion. So, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to, I'm talking myself into adding it. But right now, 9. 9 is good. It works because 9 is the number for transformation. And for birth, because nine months uh, a human is born, right, from the womb. So, yeah, nine works great with this, with the purposes that God has. There's always a ten. It can be nine, and nine is always a part of ten. So right now we've already said what was the ten. The complete picture was, will be placing uh, Moses in a burning bush right in there. But we're not going to do that just yet just yet but anyway you have that now today we got a lot to talk about today I'm going to talk about experiences in the speaking of tongues that hardly anyone knows about no one talks about uh, and again this is not to say that the Pentecostal church 
is the is God's church on the on on the earth? You know, this is this is not an attempt to because the series is how to identify the true church, right? So I'm not trying. I'm not going through this to portend that the Pentecostal church, even though I am a Pentecostal minister, but many Pentecostals don't consider me Pentecostal. But we'll explain a little about that later. Um, that I'm trying to show oh, that the Pentecostal church is the true church. That is not what you know, because I know better than that. Believe me. <laughs> All right. None of the identified churches are the true church. None of them. And anyone who tells you that they are, they're just don't know. They don't know everything. And that's also, you know, it's not that they're deceiving you. It's just they think they know everything. They, th they think they understand it all. I mean, their churches and the church creeds made sense to them. And so, and that, and in that framework, they were able to grow to some degree, but that is not the whole truth. Um, they need to keep growing and grow through the religion above and beyond the religion, because you really do need to go beyond the religion. But it's, it's a start. For many people, it is a start. It is a beginning. And uh, that's why we need to mutually respect one another's uh, religious belief because it is part of being on the right path. It is not the right path, but it is leaning towards it. So, but, the, but if you're going to stop and make your tent, now remember, that's what? That's a whole lot. So you, you're going to stop and make your tent, then that's a whole lot, and that's what you don't need to do, because that's a whole lot of baloney, okay? So don't do that. But you need to go through and seek God to put His tent in your, in your, in your life, because that is a holy bar. That's the holy house. That's what God does. That's the grace of God. So people who understand term, term, the terms in the Christian ter, uh, terminology, now things are, are, are clicking because it makes sense, right? It makes sense now that you're seeing that things are falling into place. Yes, of course. But not if you just stay focused in your uh, religious denomination, your religious practice, because that will tend to make you build a tent with no relationship with God. Because the point is that we, we, you know, the whole point that God is trying to recreate or refashion is, uh, is this. This is the point. Ladies and gentlemen, you got you to gotta understand, I'm, I'm making it bigger here, that Genesis 3 is God's purpose. That's the whole purpose in it all. God wants to walk in the paradise with man. That's what he wants. That's, that's what was lost. And so the, everything else, it has to lead here. And, and you have to allow yourself to follow God. Follow him. Not your religion. Follow him. Okay? So he will take you through your religious framework and he will bring you into a personal relationship with him that cannot be denied you cannot become an atheist after that <laughs> no way it's like denying your mother oh i don't got a mother uh, my mother doesn't exist you know stuff like that you can't you can't okay <laughs> all right so it's the same thing with god god wants the relationship where you cannot deny it So the, we're going to talk a, a little bit more about it. When I start talking about my experience, today is going to be a big day. So you get ready for that because we're going into it. Now, we were in Acts 2, the famous uh, Pentecostal, day of Pentecost uh, situation, the tongues, speaking of tongues. We already showed you there's a speaking of tongues. And what we didn't talk about too much, I mentioned it once. I believe in this uh, series, is that the speaking of tongues is not a New Testament thing. 
Okay, I'll let that sit there for a second. Now, why do I say this? Because you remember in Acts 2, what was the descriptors about this Holy Spirit outpouring upon the those in attendance, the disciples there, and the believers who were gathered together? Um, what was a common uh, sight? When the people, for those people who either understood or didn't understand, because some people, when you're reading, you're you are led to believe that certain people understood everything that was going on, and they were praising God for the, His wonders that were being spoken. Okay, because you get that language in that in that chapter, but you also have there that other people were commenting, well, these are drunk, man. These guys are drunk. They're falling, you know. And why would they call them drunk? Out of their minds, right? Because they were speaking German or French. <laughs> Maybe the French. I could get that. You're speaking French, you're drunk out of your mind. <laughs> but, come on. They were, talk they were saying that they were drunk because they were falling over themselves. So the idea here is that the falling over and falling down is a very common characteristic of the presence of God in a, in sp in a space where m there are men, okay? When, women and men, even children. Where there are human beings and God's presence is filling that space uh, they're going to be falling. They're going to be shaking and falling. And these are things that when somebody looks at people shaking and talking gibberish, they're falling down. You know, you say, this guy's mad. <laughs> they are crazy, right? That's what you're going to say. <laughs> And, and and that's and that's what people say, you know, today. They 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 pass by Pentecostal church. You guys are crazy in there. Oh boy, oh, 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 talking gibberish and falling over themselves. So, you know, yeah, if you have people drunk out of their minds, which was something that was done back in the day, you don't see too much of that now. You'll see it in like the street bum. He's drunk. He got his bottle of whiskey. He's looking around, trying to keep his balance. You know, okay. But he hasn't drunk. He hasn't been drinking out of his mind. But back in the day, people did that. There was no HBO. <laughs> there was no TV. Right? There was no public library to go and read a sophisticated book or even a, a, a novel. Uh, you just drank until you dropped. And so this is this is something that we need to look back at and you know realize you know these people are drinking themselves out of their minds and falling over. And so now when we see and talking Jerry, you draw your you know, you know the way you're saying and you just you know, you just you, you can't control your tongue even, then it's going to sound like gibberish. You don't understand. What is this guy talking about? Oh, he's just drunk. You leave him alone. You know, and they say things that are incoherent. Incoherent. So, this was a, a, a marker. What a lot of people, I'm surprised, a lot of Christians don't even know this, that this was a marker for a prophet. <laughs> That's why you, you see it's not just in the Bible, but also in, in, in cultures around the world, uh, when you're in a, especially in a historic reference, when there's an old religion involved, you have this idea that a, 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 a person that was um, falling down, or a person who demonstrated some weird movements 
and then obviously couldn't speak or wasn't speaking right. Um, they would say, "Oh, this 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 man is touched by God." <laughs> you know, it would be, "Oh, this this he must be an oracle of God." This was, was the belief in ancient times. These were special people. Um, they were the prophets of God. Then you, when you read in the Bible where you had the prophets, the big guys, right? You know, Elisha and, and um, Elias, right? So, Elisha and... Eli Let me see this. Get this straight here. Let me... Uh, let me get one of these out here so I can see. You have these great prophets in the Bible... You would see also in the scripture, you will see, I'm just trying to get the English, because I know a lot of these things in Spanish, and Elisha, right, and Elijah should be the other one, if I'm not mistaken, which I could be, it should be Elijah, right. So, yeah, so that's what it was. So between these two, these two, you know, every time they would stop, you have Isaiah 2 in the Bible. It says, the Spirit of God is upon me. What does that mean? Well, what usually came before that moment was a, a time of shaking or a time that they would fall to the ground or and or they would speak a gibberish they would be shaking and speaking something but no one understood what that on and then when the prophet that's what they went to school for by the way there was a school of prophets because they had to learn how to correctly present the word of God to prophesy and so one one of the main instruction an important one was that the spirit of God after you gave came to came to your senses you need to say, and the Spirit of God is upon me, right? And then say the prophecy, the, 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 the message from God. That was the requirement. And that was the, what was happening. Throughout the Old Testament, you don't see the detail, but you can catch it. You see uh, when the, the young youth, the young youth came to the prophet, he was drawn out. <laughs> right? And the prophet was in the spirit. The kids didn't know that. They just saw an old drunk man. <laughs> you see, so again, was he drunk? Or was, you know, was he the prophet of God? You know, so you have to be careful about why, when you're reading in scripture and you see certain things or comments stated, you have to you have to realize hey, wait, maybe there's something more to this, especially if they're a prophet. It wasn't just that they were drunk, right? Because part of the process was the shaking and the quivering and the uh, speaking in gibberish, and then and the spirit of God is upon me, and. XYZ, and this is what the message is. And so that, that was part of it. It's throughout the Old Testament. So it's not, and the, the, you have the priests falling down, you have Israel and Exodus 20, as we already discussed. That, that word uh, in that verse does not mean removed. It means, yeah, moved again and again and again, as in being shaken. <laughs> Okay, so we did that teaching already. Look at the previous teachings here. All right, so so that's what we begin, what we have to understand. We have to understand that the Acts two is not a new thing. That's what you all have to understand. Acts two, the speaking in tongues, the shaking, the falling down, all of that is not new. It is not just in Acts two. It's not just a New Testament church thing. It isn't. 
it is an Old Testament prophet thing. And it was an Old Testament Israel thing for one time where God wanted to speak directly to Israel and they didn't want it, right? They didn't want it because why? Because they were afraid of what? Dying. Why did they get that idea from? Because everybody was shaking and falling down. <laughs> so it's there. It's just, you know, it, it wasn't translated fully because it didn't make sense to the translators. It doesn't make sense. It has to be that they moved. They, they moved and then they moved again, you know, to away. That made more sense to the translators of the Bible. But the Hebrew word, it's, it means this. And then they were moved. Then, then there's another word for move. So they moved. But that first time it was shaken. <laughs> okay? But it didn't make sense to the translator, King James Version. So that's just one example. So it's there in Exodus 20, as early as that. Why is it there as early as that? Because God is there as early as that. That's the reason. And that's why you see that. Okay? So you, you have to see the threat. So, that being said, now that you understand that, now we, uh, we go into... Uh, in last week's uh, teaching, we already talked about the different languages. Uh, why was it spoken in language? I'm going to share with you as well in this lesson <clears throat> a conversation that I'm having. Let, and let me first, let me just finish with the revelation. So let's do that first. I'm going to get here later. I'm going to finish off with the 21st. Revelation 21st. Okay. Now, Revelation 21 it talks about the following. Let's read in the scripture here. Uh, using Bible Gateway. Wonderful resource, guys. Send them some money. Those on donations would be greatly appreciated. And it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. So this is something coming down out of heaven. Remember Jacob's ladder? Coming down out of heaven, right? Jesus in the transfiguration. Moses up at Mount Sinai with the law coming down out of heaven, right? The tabernacle, remember, with the Shekinah of, of Jehovah during the day, the fire, the pillar of fire at night coming down out of heaven. Same thing happened in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was full of cloud, of a cloud that was the presence of God in its fullness come down out of heaven, all right? So we see the same patterns, the same thing happening in different ways, but it's the same idea from the beginning. Remember that. Given well, why was it different than the Garden of Eden? Did God do that in the Garden? There was no need. Adam and Eve were not in sin, so you guys, you guys have to remember they weren't in sin. So that's going to be a pure situation. The others that follow were not. They were conditioned uh, because of man being in sin. So they had to be in a little different manner, right? But still the same concept. And absolutely, who's building that city so that man can be with God? Was it, was it man? No. See, it's not your religion. That's not your church. That's not your church coming down from heaven. You got you. Everyone needs to understand that. You really need to understand that that's not your church. <laughs> it's not the Pentecostal church. It's not the Catholic church. It isn't the uh, the um, Baptist church. It's not the Mormon church. It's not uh, the Seventh Day Adventist church. It's not any other the church. No Hindu. No Buddhist. No temples. There. None of that. No, it's not a. a it's not Mecca. Yeah, that's not the Mecca coming down, no. See, it's not any man-made religion. This is 
the, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God. From God. Okay? That's what God is doing. So your religion can stay home. This is what God is doing. So y'all need to understand what God is doing. Because everything else, all right? Out of her, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Now, where did we hear this marriage thing before? Yeah, it's, you've been hearing that since the Garden of Eden. As a matter of fact, that's where the first human marriage took place. What was God telling us with that? See, it's a story made to teach you what is important for God that man understand. See? And so that's what this is about. And we see at the end here that this is what it's about. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Now you see how he brings out that word tabernacle. Now we had the tabernacle in, in the uh, in the desert, right? That's the tent. The tabernacle is means the tent. Ah, oh, the the uh, the ahola. No, this one's not the ahola, right? It's the holy bar, right? That my tent in her, my tent in her. So you see, here we have, and the issue is, why is there a tent still? Very good question. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So, um, basically saying that God will take away the tears from their eyes. He sat, he sat upon the throne, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, write, for these words are true and faithful, right? And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. So all the things that are old are passed away. What was old? The Garden of Eden. See? The, and, and the Tower of Babel and Mount Sinai and everything that happened, all the, the things that happened in between. All of that is gone away. I will give you now the true life freely. You're, it's, we are open here. We're together. We are together again like we were in the Garden of Eden. He that overcometh shall inherit all things in the Garden of Eden. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. Like in the Garden of Eden. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, right? And so, again, this is, again, what uh, the message is, right? Not that we should be scaring people with the fire and brimstone. It's only that... You don't need to be scared of the fire and brimstone. You should want to follow God, period. God is giving here some details. That's all. But this is not like the gospel message. Oh, you got to believe in me or you're going to die in hell. No, that is not. This is a detail, <laughs> all right, for the church, for us to know, for our own, so we can have understanding of what all this salvation is, is for, and this and that. But it's really not the part of the gospel message that we need to be emphasizing. People need to, to follow God because they see God in our lives. So that's, I think, is very important. That you want to follow God. You want to believe in God and serve God. That's it. If, if there's a God or if there isn't, I'm going to live my life as if there was a God and I'm going to do what I need to do uh, to uh, please that God because in any sense while I'm doing that I'm doing good for humanity I'm doing good for myself and for others that's basically the, uh, any reason based away from having a real personal relationship with God I mean on bottom line that's the way it should be in any case so now 
look what it says here and then there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying come hither come hither come up here I will show thee the bride the lamb's wife and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain here we go to a mountain now and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Okay, that means it was pure. And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and begins to describe the city. Now, the curious thing about this city is the name of the 12 tribes. If people cannot just discard the Old Testament, you can't just discard the Torah, right? It's not about that. This is the, this is the makeup of the walls of the city. It's not the city itself, okay? But it's the makeup of the walls, the, the entry point. How did we all get here? Well, we got here through these gates, which was were the things that God had placed in, with the twelve tribes and established. Okay, these are the entry gate. That's not your home now. Because some people that say, "See, you see, you need the law." No, the law is always here. The issue was getting past the gate. Because no one can fulfill the law. It's something you cannot erase from Scripture. The Scripture says that no man can fulfill all the law. So that means you can't get through the gate. That's what it means. So now we, are, we have entry through the gate. Who has given us entry through the gate? Okay, so because the Hebrews this and that, they want to make a big deal that the gates have the names of the twelve tribes. It's just the gate, buddy. <laughs> it's the gate. The city is inside. The, the people live inside. They don't live in the gate. Okay, so on the east three gates, on the north three gates, the south three gates, on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Foundations. You don't live there, but they're the foundations. And in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, what, what is built on. So the gates, look at the picture. The gates of the city are the 12 tribes of Israel, right? But the foundation of the city, this, this encompasses what the city is in totality, not just the front, the doors to get in. But the totality is what was built upon the work and the lives of the 12 apostles. That's what the foundation is. So think about it. Because some people just stuck at the gate. Oh, see, this is the tribe. Of, and, and you're the tribe of this. And we're the tribe of that. And tribe and tribe and tribe. That's just the front gate. I know it's beautiful to look at. It's wonderful. It's, it's, it's a glorious thing. But... The city is inside. That's where everything's happening. Okay, just so just you guys can understand. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof and the city lie of four square. And then he gives the measurements of the city and he measured the wall. So he's measuring the wall and he gave it... Um, to, and he gave that measurement to John according to the measure of a man that is of the angel and the building of the wall of it was jasper the city was pure gold like unto clear glass and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones okay so it goes through what these stones were you go into a study of this there's meanings to every one of these and the twelve gates, twelve pearls, every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the sea was pure gold, as if it was transparent glass. And I saw, key, no temple, no temple therein, okay? Very important. Why wasn't there a temple? 
because it's no longer needed. Remember what the purpose of the temples were and the tabernacle, right? So all of that is gone now. There's no longer a temple needed because everything has been done. Okay? For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. See, they are now the temple. So that, that's it. And the temple represented something else too, right? The tabernacle. But it was the union, the place where man and God could be together. Right? Garden of Eden. The Mount Sinai. The tabernacle. The temple in Jerusalem. Right? Transfiguration. Jesus there. Right? The, anti, uh, the uh, pouring of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost. Speaking in tongues. And then now the holy city. But now no more temple. There's no temple here. Because it is all about God. And the city had no need of the sun. Because the sun is also an important teacher. You see it here like, oh yeah, we're going to talk about nature. But it's not talking about nature. This is related to the issue that there's no, no temple. The sun and, and the moon are referring to the Hebrew religion, to the Jewish beliefs. And the sun is what came after the Jewish belief, which are the Christian beliefs. That became the, the sun of day, the, the light of day. As opposed to the Jewish teachings, the Hebrew uh, Israel, which had the moon. And that's why their religion is based on moon. That's what yours is based on. Right? The Hebrew is based on that. For the glory of God did lighten. So now what is there? There's neither moon or sun. All that is done because the glory of God is shining fully. See, the truth of God is what is here. Everything else that came before was sun or moon. And in the order was moon and sun, right? Because that makes a day, a yom. So first came the moon, the night time, and then the sun. So you have to understand it. first the Hebrew teachings and then the Christian teaching. That's that's basically what you guys can believe what you want to believe, say what you want to believe. But that's not what the Bible is teaching. It's not what is, is being shown. Here in relation to the temple, what the, oh, we talk about the sun and moon. Okay? So and the gates of it shall be not shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. So come on now. <laughs> yeah. You guys got to understand what's going on. What is the message here? See? Because if you have a problem that the Christian church that's in the daylight, in the sun, doesn't keep uh, all of the commandments, you know, like the Shabbat, then you're going to have a real issue here. There ain't no sun. There ain't, they, I'm sorry, there ain't no moon in the holy city at all. Because the truth of God is what is the light there. That's the understanding. That's what it means that there's no, there's no need for sun anymore because everyone would be in the light of God. It would be pure light. Not reflected light and shadows, which was the Torah and uh, the law and not even the sun which is still human understanding religion about you know about what used what was lighting the sun the, the uh, sorry lighting the moon and and that understanding which is still not the light of god but it's a good representation it's good for uh, us here as human beings but it isn't the full light of the Lamb and of the Father right there. See, that is not what's, uh, what we have yet. But the, the Son represents that. It's a representing of that. But there ain't going to be no night there. So that is it. Now they shall, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Okay. So basically, this is talking about that... Union with God at the end. 
which is what God is um, looking for and why he did everything he did before we get here. Okay? It all has to do with understanding, knowledge, okay? The light is of God, of the Lamb. That's what it all has to do with. And there's different teachings that you're going to find about uh, when exactly this is happening or did it happen already and stuff like that. That again, I'm not going to get into at this at this moment. But that is the culmination of the need for the tent of the temple, right? And the culmination of religion. Ain't no religion anymore here. There's no more temple. There's no more religion. And that's the other thing. There ain't going to be no Buddhists, Muslims, or or Hindus, or, uh, you know, this church or that church, Pentecostal, all otherwise, then. Because the truth will be out and open and clear. It will be clear, okay, of the truth of God. And again, that's up for interpretation or not. But that's what it, that's what it's showing us here. All right, so that is my graphic. I hope that you guys have been able to gain some more understanding about this issue. Now, I'm going to go straight in. I'm over time, but I think it's necessary for us to get into those little things. I'm going to mention a lot of things. You should write them down if you care to have, uh, have them and remember them. These are things I don't talk about a lot, but I'm going to talk about them now. And so let's go with that. Now, um, I guess the first thing to deal with the Pentecostalness, the Pentecostal issue, is are all the tongues being spoken in the church true tongues of God? The quick answer to that is absolutely not. Absolutely not. Whenever we're talking about God and man and anything having to do with God and man, you, you don't look at the masses. <laughs> don't look at the big numbers. Because the bigger number you have of people, the more people you have. In other words, the more man you have and the less of what God is doing. What you have to know is that it's in the fewer number. The fewer numbers where you're going to find where, you know, really that God is doing something. Um, and so, you know, you don't need a, a church full of people rebuking the devil for the devil to be rebuked. All you need is one person full of God to rebuke the devil. Okay, so you have to understand that. So don't go by the whole church that says it's talking in tongues and the devil is getting rebuked. Don't go by that. Because there's really just one person rebuking the devil in that whole church. And, I'm going to, and I know that for a fact. <laughs> because it actually occurred. And I was there. And guess who was doing I was at a church, of, 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 I, I won't say anymore because then people can guess where I was and who and who was that and who was that. I'm not mentioning names here uh, to protect the guilty and the innocent. But we were, I, we were in church, I, I was visiting. The whole church, you know, there was a time where the whole church just broke out spontaneously in uh, the moving of the Spirit. And... You know, I I was I closed my eyes. I also felt the spirit was moving. It's just, it was a genuine move of the spirit. It wasn't in the flesh or, or carnal or anything like that. But during that moment, during it was a few moments. It was very. It was a longer lasting experience or event than usual. Okay, so that was the first thing. Wait a minute, this thing is, is longer than the usual. So, so that was the first thing that distinguished this event. I was in the, in the back of the church, 
and I was in, in the spirit, but I was also the 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 problem was that, or well, it's not a problem, it's that the reality is, God always has me learning things about the church, and that's that's the reason why I can do this teaching here today. I know these things because God was teaching me things about the church, about the reality of the church during all my years in the church, and I, I, all the churches, Christian churches, as well as my own, the, the Pentecostal one, right, where I grew up in. And God said, pay attention, because again, me and God, you know, we're besties like that, and I, I, I mean to poke fun at that. But it's actually, it's, I'm very serious about that. I, I have a personal relationship with God. That's why I say I can never be an atheist. I would be like denying my mother. So the personal relationship I have with God and joy with God, okay, at that early age of time that I was, I was um, that time I was... I'm trying to see if I was before. It, it had to be my my mid, early to mid teens. So I'm trying to figure, you know, yeah, because I later on, uh, when I got to be 18, I think I, I was uh, gone from my uh, church of, of birth. So it had to happen before that. So yeah, so around those time that time period. Uh, the, the God told me pay attention and and then God said to me he said there's a demon here right look at what the church is doing so these are the things that uh, you know this is the way God was teaching me so I was looking at the, at the church prayerfully I wasn't like disrespecting the the, the moment but I am also with that, I wasn't in, in the given into the flow, right? But yet I was more in it than most of the people there. Because they were not aware of what was going on. See, so like I said, the God told me there's there's a demon here. And I then realized that, wait a minute, that this demon is hiding. <laughs> this demon is one of the people here, or at least one of the people here that had the demon, was acting like everyone else. This is the problem that the, that the Pentecostal church has, is that you have a lot of people talking gibberish, enjoying themselves, like in the morning. They feel God. God is there. But everything else is, is, a lot of it is learned, it's, it's things that they picked up, and then they get stuck there. And so this is my religious experience, it's my really, every time I feel the spirit, I gotta go the same, and they say the same thing. You, and you know, you'd, you know that you're one of these folks because you repeat the same thing over and over and over and over again. It's like you learn to speak, hello, good morning, how are you? God bless you in gibberish. And then that's all you say all the time. Hello, good morning, God bless you, you know, have a good day, goodbye. And you keep saying that all throughout your Christian life. And if the Spirit of God moves in the church, you say, hello, good morning, how are you? <laughs> you're saying the same thing. So that's how you know you're one of these folks here. It doesn't mean that you're not feeling the presence of God. Or that God isn't moving. Yes, He is. You know, the presence of God is there. He is moving. It just you got stuck with saying these same tongues all the time. Okay, so that's the one big, big, big problem that the Pentecostal Church has. See, I criticize my church, right? <laughs> I want to see any of these Hebrews this or that do that about their church. All right, be truthful. Okay, and we we're speaking the truth here. So now. So, the, so that was the first thing. So we got this church full of people. Oh, everybody's talking their favorite tongues from here to Sunday. And then, but yet none of them realize, and un, the, unfortunately, not even the pastor. So the pastor's in the moment. He's, well, 
I said, this is it. Yeah, this is why I started this church for. We can feel the power of God. That's it. Let's go. We're having it. It's happening now. That's it. It's like, uh, you know, some of the guys I see that in the preparedness community, they say, uh, oh, this is, this is big emergency news. They keep saying that. Like, this is it. <laughs> so this is their day. This is their moment. So the pastor was in it as well. He was just going off. And I was looking around also because I was trying to hear or to note if anyone was in a different attitude. Was any, and basically, was anyone rebuking this demon? Did anyone realize there's a demon here? And is anyone else, you know, or anyone at that point, it wasn't anyone else that I hadn't started yet. But hey, is anyone rebuking this demon? And and it's almost like God was saying, "Look, look and see to find one." And I couldn't find anybody. You know. But at at while all of this is happening, my mouth starts to move. Praise God! I, every time I think about it, I go back to the moment. My mouth begins to start. To move, and the the tongue begins to come out audibly, and I feel in my spirit like almost as an outrage. It's almost as an anger from inside coming out. Like it's almost like when you're vomiting. That's the way I was feeling. But the spiritual wasn't that I was gagging on vomit. But inside, in a in a spiritual sense, if I could, you know, that wasn't physical. It was different, and it was a, a manner of anger, or not just anger, but maybe authoritative is the best word. Not anger, authoritative. It was forceful, like when you you're vomiting. It wasn't that I was trying to speak in tongues now. No, because I, I don't do that. But this one was coming out, uh, coming out, <laughs> coming out, <laughs> whatever. The words that were spoken there, and it was just coming out like, like, like I was vomiting, it's coming out. And, but I felt authoritative. I wasn't feeling victimized. I wasn't feeling sick. I was feeling like this has to be said, and this has to be said, and this has to be said. And my finger started to point out like this. Again, unnecessary for a demon. But necessary for this teaching today. In other words, it was part of the symbols to give an ex a meaning of what's happening. And probably, I don't know. I haven't heard the pastor who later, and I'll tell you when he recognized the demon. But later he, he looked. And he said, wait a minute, there's a demon here. Holy cow, you know, <laughs> right? But that was after I had started rebuking the demon. When I started rebuking the demon, still didn't know who it was. And I, po I pointed like this. I don't know why I'm pointing. Who's looking at me? I don't know. This one person started jumping over one of the pews. And then another, and I was going like this, and then another, and another. This is mayhem going on. Everybody's thinking like everyone's getting here, baptized in the spirit. Woo! -wee. This is like a <coughs> like all that you imagine Pentecostal church or know of them. Yet something was going on, and by the time this guy, it was a man. Rolled around, jumped over pews, and oh, 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 like that. And I sensed, because I have the senses, that the demon was so frightened. Because now he, he realized his cover was blown. And then at the point where he's heading like towards the altar, then I can sense some other people now, like they're feeling something's wrong here. There's, there's something not right. Right, because then you can hear it, that you can audibly hear like a change, a little change, when like, like they started like realizing. It's my my perception 
that they started realizing, wait a minute, there's something not right here. Something, something happening here. And the guy gets thrown to the altar. The guy just went rolling over these pews, bouncing, jumping all over there. It was ridiculous. <laughs> okay? And then he flops at the foot of where the pastor was. And the pastor's there still. He's like, wait a minute. And I, you know, the, it, because it takes you a while to realize wait a minute, there's something wrong here. So that's when the pastor then realized, wait a minute. I got a, this is not a blessing of God. This is a, this is a demon here has been dragged over here to the front. So I, we can, we, what I have to do is lay hands and rebuke this demon. Because the pastor wasn't a slob. And that's the funny thing. That, that pastor, particular pastor, a man of prayer, man of great faith, a great preacher, okay? Fiery preacher. So he was not a slob. But it's, it's a human condition. That's all I can say. It's just a human condition. We, we're not always there, you know. You know, so... Anyway, he did what he was supposed to do. The, my tongues continued until the pastor got through with his prayer and all that. This guy was done. And that demon was done. That demon had to leave. And when that demon left... I all, we all felt it. I felt it. It went. Period. Amen. It was a glorious day and a glorious event. But I learned a lot there, as you can tell. A lot of things, a lot of things were learned. So, so that was one experience I had. The you can't go by the numbers uh, at best, and like people say that most of the. Uh, most of what they experienced in the church was emotional. We're emotional creatures. There's nothing you can experience that isn't emotional. It's kind of retarded. Well, I won't say retarded, right? But it, it's something that you can't... What else? Is any person in the Bible that you read that had anything to do with God was emotional. <laughs> what, you think Moses was just up there? Mm. Mm -hmm. The God or the creator of God? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen. They, these guys got emotional. They were emotionally charged by their experiences because we are emotional creatures. So it's kind of, I can't say it's like stupid. It is. But if you don't know, you don't understand the spiritual things, the spiritual, the if you don't know what conceptually is valid, Considering spiritual entities uh, interacting with physical bodies of, of humans with, that are alive, at least. Um, if you don't understand that little part of uh, our experience base, uh, then it does, it look, you know, it, 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 you, you're saying things that, you know, you're seeing things that don't make sense. But, and I, it's unfair to call you stupid for doing that. Except for the fact that, you know, if you ignore now my explanations of things, then you are becoming uh, stupid. You are insisting on being that. Because we're giving you uh, uh, biblical bases and experiential th things that have occurred uh, that uh, de defy your natural processes other than the interactions w with those things or perceptions which are natural of course there is a line be where a supernatural thing uh, becomes a natural pers uh, perspective an issue of, nat of natural perspective <laughs> The natural perspective doesn't change what a thing is, really. But it, it provides a method for us to gain some knowledge, some understanding of something, as opposed to someone who is devoid of it entirely. So that's the reality. You had to at least examine this from a point of view. Well, if, if something was genuinely happening, would a person have an emotional reaction? Yes or no? You know, it makes sense that you would. We get uh, if the temperature goes down ten degrees in, in a wind like that, you're gonna feel chill. You're gonna go, Ooh. 
What was that? Oh, that's that's just emotion. No, it's <laughs> something is happening, right? So you have to understand that there's a reaction. So in the same way, if there is spiritual anything, there's going to be some reactions to that. I want to go into this other um, a Reddit that I was interacting with a um, a commenter, and I wanted to show you that. Um, because I think it'll answer some other questions about glossolalia. It had to do with glossolalia. And let's see how fast we can get it. We, everything is, is slow here in the country. Alrighty. Um, Let me go here. We're having a back and forth. And I just wanted to share this with you. It's in a Christianity forum. And and so I wanted to share with you. And this has no bearing on the person. This is I'm just using this to share some concepts. Because these are shared by a lot of people. It's not just this person. So... This is an answer that I gave to this person I responded. And uh, I said, your experience is formative for how you understand these verses. We're talking about uh, the verses concerning the Holy Spirit um, that Paul writes about the speaking in tongues. And I think this is true for everyone who is Pentecostal or Pentecostal leaning or in leaning. With most Pentecostals, my understanding is that they, and this is what a person, the person said, okay, a, a, the Pentecostal, my understanding is that they go to a Pentecostal church, have one of these experiences of ecstatic utterances, and then get shown particular cherry-picked verses, which tend to be singular verses taken out of a passage, and, and all told, this is what you experienced. It is so far most... It is so for most Pentecostals, and this was my response, uh, but not in my case. When I arrived to a Pentecostal church, I observed, and this was eight years old, eight years of age, I observed and questioned in my own mind, what was the truth of the gospel? Because that was my first concern. <laughs> I wasn't concerned about these people talking gibberish. I was concerned of what is this gospel issue? Is this true? You know? And of this experience. It was secondary. And, and, and what about this? So I witnessed that I was witnessing all around me. For me, my first concern was, is there a God? Okay? Forget about all this gibberish. I'm trying to say, is there a God? And and, and then this, this thing here, then what that? What's about that? It is wrong to use generalities in any issue, especially when the issue concerns a God who wills and does whatever he pleases at whichever time or season it be for us. And this is a danger for everybody. Because most of you people in your church, you figure that God doesn't, you know, he doesn't, um, he doesn't do things in different ways. Now, you say, no, but God doesn't change. Yeah, but who told you that God was doing everything he does in, in one time? That's the problem. Because a lot of people, see how people make dumb assumptions? You say, well, God did it this way with Moses. Let's just put it in general terms here. God did this in one way with Moses. Okay, so then you figure, well, God doesn't change. So then, that's it. Well, God didn't show all his tricks. How, you know, have you ever thought of that? That God hasn't shown us everything. But how can you say that? Well, because the Bible says that. The Bible says that these are shadows. Shadows of things to come. <laughs> See, the problem is that God doesn't change. We are the ones that change. And we are the ones that are in one time or another. God is eternal. So you're not going to see all things about God in one time. And just because you see God at one time this way, doesn't mean that you're not going to see God another way at a later time. But you cannot say 
that God changed, you can't say that. It's just simply that time wasn't the time for him to be the, that way. It's just simply he's been the same all the time except that at certain times he teaches in one way, he explains things in one way that later come out as being, that, those things being a shadow of things that were to come in a different light later. And that's what you have between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It doesn't mean that God changed. But there's limitations to what God can show man at one time. There's not a change in God. It's man who is changing over time. And, and therefore the message of God is amplified. Amplified. That's simply it. So again, it's a mistake that people are making. Common one, by the way. For me, it wasn't an issue of being shown cherry-picked verses. It was reconciling the happenings in the Bible with a present-day church, for I saw and still see no reason for the true church of Christ to be any different than the initial one. Because uh, they were men. The initial one was men. There's only one difference, and that is that they were Jewish men. <laughs> and people still don't get this right. They were Jews. So there is an inherent difference between the Jewish Christian and the, uh, what you call the Gentile Christian. There is a fundamental difference. Um, so, and, and I say it here, with the exception of cultural realities within which the church is formed as people act and do different things within their respective social context and given any previous biblically based obligations, and I'm hinting here directly, to the Jews and their obligation to the law. And there's reasons for that, right? But if they don't know the reasons and, you're, and you were Christian, you were in a Gentile Christian scenario, and then you become a Hebrew Christian because you felt that the Gentile Christian are in some way wrong, that you have denied, and then you're also denying that, that Christian, that Gentile Jesus. That's a problem. And I'll show you where the problem is, because if you had faith in God and God's grace for saving you with that Gentile Jesus back then, you just denied it. You just gave that up. Because the, that work of the reality of salvation, that's God's doing, not yours. It's not an issue of your realization. That's what you need to realize. The grace of God is not about your realization. It's about what God is doing. And all he asked you to do was believe in his son, Jesus Christ. And if you came to Jesus Christ with, and, and believed in him, then you were saved by grace. By faith in God and in God's grace. That's it. You were saved. Now when you gave that up, now to pursue something that you're thinking, your own tent, this is the problem that a lot of you guys are not understanding. That you, got, you guys have denied the faith. You've denied your Lord and Savior. How do you figure you're saved now? Ah, oh, because now I know the truth? You thought you knew the truth before. My goodness. Oh, so, so anyway, I continue. There are Pentecostals, and then there are Pentecostals. All are not the same as Christians of any denomination are all not the same. All Jews were not the same as also not all early and later church Christians were either. So there are differences, always have been. Even P there was differences between Peter and Paul. They, they, you know, Paul had a fight with Peter. You know, just uh, a doctrinal fight, you know, disagreement. What do you guys? I mean, Peter, uh, Paul called him an, uh, a hypocrite. For goodness' sake, come on now, we're talking. Let's talk. All right. So I appreciate your attempt at labeling and simplification for argument's sake. It isn't apropos for this discussion, in my view. Assuredly, it does look so in your lens, but that is the nature of this conversation. 
So now for the first response. I'd like you to imagine a situation where you had not been part of the, the Pentecostal church and your church used Bible translations which used languages instead of tongues and you didn't first have this experience of ecstatic utterances. Do you think you still read the text in the same way? And then I responded, well, I certainly would not think that English was the language of angels or the language of heaven. See, because I'm I'm going to I'm going for the throat here, because he's gonna he's trying to just talk about these uh, languages that were spoke that day, right? But I'm going to the point. The real point is what is what are angelic languages? Period. I would have thought that there is some sort of communication in heaven and between spiritual beings that was not a human language. So why do we speak? Why do humans speak? When God made Adam and Eve, why did he give them a voice to speak? Unless communication between beings was something that was had. And we see throughout the Bible that God speaks to his angels. The angels come and speak to man. So we see that. We see that communication is a thing in heaven. So that's why the question, you know, you, that's where we have to begin. We're talking about spiritual thing. We have to start in heaven. We can't start here. We got to start up there. To then bring that down to see how it affects us here. So, so I would interpret the verses according to their context. And also know that there must be an angelic language as well. How would I have made such a determination at eight years of age? Right? And then I, I, because I was and still am a bright scientific method thinker, it's the truth, by nature. I didn't learn, I learned about the scientific method, and I, I, I should explain this a little bit. I learned about the scientific method in school. <coughs> but that wasn't the first time I dealt with the scientific method. It's just simply I didn't realize that it was the scientific method. And this is what happened. When I was in school, the topic came, scientific method, in the science class. And I was reading. Uh, the teacher was guiding us in the reading, the textbook, right? And when it described what the scientific method was, my jaws began to drop. I began to drop down and I said, holy cow. You know what I was what I realized then? That's where I realized, hey, this is the way I think. <laughs> because before then, before that moment, I thought I was like a little crazy. I gotta tell you. I would look at a fence full of locks on there. Just on the fence, you know, within the within the chains of the lock, you know, I'm sorry, of the fence, the chain links, right? That's the wall of the fence, not the gate, just the wall of the, of the fence at school, walk out of school every day and I will look at this thing full of locks. You know, if, and my, I'm a little kid, you know, locks cost money. And I'm looking at these locks, I said, who is crazy enough to put these locks put their locks on this fence and walk away from it. <laughs> so for me, it didn't make any sense. And I was I was very, what do you call it, analytical. And I was saying, what type of mind would do this and for what purpose? So that's the, that's the way I am. That's why I'm a psychotherapist today. So you have to understand where I came from. All right? I was looking at things people were doing. Oh, another big thing for people in the city. The sneakers on the telephone wire, electric wire. You never heard that? Oh, man. That was another one of my uh, analytical uh, moments. Who is a crazy nut that does this? <laughs> so I was always looking at things and analyzing why is this this way and testing things as well. I was very good at, at things. I, I could tell what somebody would say and do. I, I was so good. I can tell what somebody would say and do if you went and told them X, Y, Z. And that happened actually with, with my friends. And I'm sure they can 
uh, testify to that if you question them. They, they'll tell you, yeah, he told me if you go and tell him X, Y, Z, he's going to say one, two, and three, and do this. I say he's going to go back like this, he's going to laugh. Exactly what I said. See? So I'm good at that. I'm really good. Now, if I'm that good, imagine the devil, because he's been watching men forever. <laughs> All right. So anyway, let's get back to so that you understand where this is coming from. I'm a psychotherapist today. I've been always had a critical thinking mind, scientific method mind, a way of reasoning things. So I'm not new. Scientific method was never new to me. This was my my set way of thinking, and it's I think it's the reason that God dealt with me differently than other people. Not because I'm special, but because he made me. He knows my mind. He knows that, you know, Gilbert, he's not going to be easily convinced. He needs the scientific method. And it's exactly what God gave. He gave me proof using scientific methodology. Given the uh, state, his state, and our state, or my state here. Absolutely. Wonderful. So, so that you understand that these things are not coming from any book or any, uh, any philosophical ideation. These are real experiences with a mind, a scientific thinking mind. But, but notice the difference. And with this, I think it will show you everything. I'm going to shut it off in, in a few minutes, in, uh, 12 minutes. I'll be ending. Where am I at? I know there's a lot of things to say, but I can't leave everything here. So anyway, so I said I did not learn or adopt the scientific method, simply. I always had a critical mind and resolved issues through testing. So if you have a reply to any part, so then I left it at that. Uh, he said uh, he still wants to, he wants me to reply to everything before he starts, because I don't want him to ignore. Because that's what they do. They like to take all your comments and then you ignore all of it and just deal with one thing. So I didn't do that. I waited for like two weeks for him to respond. Um, so then I quote him. I say, I've actually had to reevaluate some of my experiences in the past. In my early days, I spent some time with some Pentecostal Christians. We engaged in some prophetic type prayer sessions. And often people would be like, I'm seeing a vision of XYZ and relating as a vision from God to life. There were a number of times when following this practice, it became clear that this sense I had, these visions that occurred, were not from God. <laughs> because they didn't play out. Which is good thinking. They don't come true. They're not from God. Exactly. And I, I had to ask, was it God giving me insights or was it my own thoughts and hopes? It led me to dig in and explore more what it means and to examine what scripture actually says. And so this is where you notice what he did. What was his reaction? Because you already know my reaction in the beginning. What is this all about? What did I do? I inquired uh, uh, to God. What does he do? He digs and explores more. Where? In what? In outside sources, right? So he wants to examine what scripture actually says. See that? And make my experience and thoughts subject to it. The problem with that is that anything that you read is going to have some sort of bias. You're wholly depending on someone else's, uh, you know, assumption, someone else's research, someone else's biases, because they're always going to favor one thing over another. So that's always going to be a bias. You're looking at what they say as if it was the Word of God over what the Word of God says. That's a problem a lot of Christians have. And this problem happens. You know why? It's very simple. I'll tell you why this happens. 
because you don't have a genuine relationship, personal relationship with the God of the Bible. That's why this happens. You need, you're in a religion. You have engaged religious experience and therefore you depend on religious books, uh, religious experiences of others, and just a, uh, you know, engage in a religious practice in order to make sense of anything you're doing. You already did that. When you went to this Pentecostal church, you simply engage in their Pentecostalism and you went with the flow. Where and when did you ever go and consult with the horse's mouth? Which means, you know, when did you go to God about this? So who were you praying to before? You see, you have a situation where people are praying supposedly to God, but then there's nothing coming back. <laughs> You're in the dark. And then instead of going to God, right, you're going to other sources. Are those sources more credible than the God that you're supposedly praying and serving? Because I have to ask. Because I wouldn't be in any type of religion if I had to be religious. If I was, you know, if I couldn't pray and talk with the God of the Bible, I wouldn't be in this thing. Because you're talking to thin air. What are you doing? The Bible's full of, of something. That God said this. God said that. God talked to who? And t God talked to him. And why can't God talk to you? That's what I figured out at eight years old. I wasn't going to be sitting there waiting for uh, Moses. When God can talk to me. And now when you see Exodus 20, that that's what God wants to do, well then, what's holding you back? <laughs> see, you don't have an excuse. What you, What's in your religion? Come and believe in God, come to God, God wants to save you, then get to Him. Why are you allowing other men to be a proxy? That's a big mistake. And this is why these things are never settled right. So, my mind, my feelings, my experience had no real solid foundation. And the only thing, the only reason he's saying that, because he thinks that that's me. He thinks that all Pentecostals are the same. That's why I explained first, not all Pentecostals are the same. We are not all the same, okay? And men, the many are that way, but the few are not. So, anyway, we'll go, we go through... And so, the first response, I'll, I'll finish with what he says. So I asked myself the question. This is the guy I'm debating with or speaking to. Is my experience, hopes, thoughts, feelings, desire shaping how I read and understand Scripture? Or is Scripture shaping how I understand my experiences, hopes, thoughts, and feelings? So what is it? You know, he can't even say what he says. He thinks. He's, he, he thinks that that's what he believed. That's not what you believe. What, what you believe is in my reading of other sources about the scriptures, is that shaping my view? And that's what you had to say. Why don't you say the truth? Because you're not going just by scripture. You're going by other resources to help you understand scripture. And I didn't do that. I went to God, the author of the scriptures, to gain understanding of the scriptures. See? Because I wouldn't have it any other way. Any other way is religious and it's gobbledygook. Might as well believe in a fairy tale. So, that's the difference. See, that's the difference of scientific mind forces... Uh, in this uh, issue of, 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 of faith and belief, other than someone who is lazy, a lazy dasical, or lazy, well, who is lazy, a lazy thinker, and just uh, believes blindly. That's the difference. So f my answer was, first, your experiences, according to your own words, were not from God, as is with so many other charismatic church members who are normed 
into similar forced and false experiences. I have observed that all the years I have been a Pentecostal. However, I have also seen and examined authentic experiences, including my own. There are many false believers in all churches. This is a common occurrence, as is also many who exercise the gifts <coughs> in mimicry. <coughs> Mimicking the authentic manifestations. Right? So these are the guys who speak in time because everyone else is doing it. It's called norming. I'm a psychotherapist. We know these things. Okay? So understand that. But those who criticize the Pentecostal church for that need to also understand that. That doesn't mean everyone is doing that. So, so don't be... Yeah, and this is... A, they, they do it all the time. They want to condemn... Um, the, they want to throw out the baby with the bathwater is what you're doing. And the only reason you're doing it is to support your own new belief or new religion. It's ridiculous. This is all you guys are all playing the game. Back and forth, back and forth. The bottom line is that ne never have you and none of the people you're dealing with have ever had a personal relationship with the God of the Bible. That's it, period. Case closed. You guys need to come to that understanding. So it says, as an apologist... I debate with many atheists who also had fake experiences which eventually led them to their present atheistic stance. You did not approach this the same way I did. As I previously mentioned, my first concern was that God prove himself to me and to engage me in a learning relationship of which he made very clear to me would involve great challenges to my inner self that would at times get very painful in the realization of my true self. Okay? This is real nitty gritty here. See, this is, this is truth right here. It's none of that religious stuff you guys hear and experience all out there. This is the real deal. God told me that you're going to suffer if we go through with what you want. Are you sure you want this? See? Because you're not going to learn things from God without it tearing you apart. Santo, hallelujah. Praise God. This is going to tear you apart. Okay? It's the, the reason why man cannot see God and live. Let's die. The truth is going to kill you. Okay? So, you know, it's, I'm, I'm using that metaphorically. But that's the reality of it. When we're dealing with God, you're naked, man. And everything about you is, 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 is exposed. Because he's going to lay it out there. Look at Job. You know, you think God, God allowed the devil to do that to Job. And look at what God tells Job. Man, where were you? You know, he goes there. God, he just, he goes there and just lays it out on Job. You ever thought about that? <laughs> yeah. He lets the devil ruin his life and bring him close to death. And then God tells Job, oh, where have you been? What do you, who do you think you are? You know that? <laughs> because the problem is that who are we, man? Who are any of us? See? This is how you know that the truth is being had. Because the same thing like Job went through, even when he was in misery because of God, yeah, I'm going to take your challenge, devil. God, you think he's not faithful? He's going to be faithful to me. Go ahead. Let's do this thing. Right? And even, even with that, God still say, I'm going to go down to Job and just lay it out. And, and God does it because he's, God is just, he's just true, man. Santo, praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God is true. And he's going to say, he sees you, you ugly, man. You fat. And ugly. He's going to tell you, man. This is the first thing. Let's not get into the teaching yet. You're just fat and ugly. He's going to tell you the truth. You know, this is your problem. Don't you see how you are? Forget about everything else. Let's talk about you. That's what's going to happen. And that's what God is warning you. You're going to learn these things because, you see, we're the ones with the eyeballs. 
We're the ones with the ears. We're the ones with the brain. So God has to get cut through all that garbage. So then, then you can start seeing clearly. That's the problem. That's what people don't understand. All right. And as noted before, each step I took with the Lord was confirmed through evidence akin to the scientific method. And within this particular context. What does that mean? You don't know, right? Well, that's why you can't do this. See, because I know what this means. Somebody else out there, you know what that means. Yeah, you know, but the majority of people watching this and even that call themselves Christian or atheists don't have a single idea what that just said there, right there. What does that mean, right? So this, that's why you can't go through this. Because you just don't understand. Okay, and I continue saying, which was my natural cognitive process, the, the scientific method. All of which was done with great timidity on my part, humility, and respect to God. So there's also something that, like these atheists, okay, I'm going to give this a test. No, you are not possibly able to give that a test because you are coming into it, you know, um, lying. You're, you're coming into it with no really understanding. Of it. You're not prepared for the truth. So this is, this is not something that every person can have. I admit to that. I, I express that. Right? But then every person cannot do this, this program and this teaching right now. See that? That's also true. He being my maker, he knew my mind and heart and honored my request. So that's what happened there. Your path took you away from God's direct instruction. Not this my criticism. He said it. He didn't say he went to God. He said he went to men. He went to men's research and, and study and st instead of going to God. Why don't you go to God first? And the simple answer to that because he doesn't, you know, he doesn't receive anything from God when he prays. Which is the first thing. I would not have gone on in, in, in my church. I would not have continued if God did not respond. If God then did not prove himself to me. And then if God didn't teach me, then what's the point? I got to learn from these men and everyone disagrees with everyone else? So th these were practical things for me. And they were essential basics for me. But obviously for the majority of people in the world, they, it is not. So this is what you have here. Okay, your path took you away from God's direct instruction and mine took me into it. So our two perspectives are quite distinct. Right? Was I going, did, did God know I was going to be a psychotherapist? Obviously he did. W was I going to be called into ministry to teach others? Obviously he did. And now I'm teaching people through these videos all throughout the world. Obviously, God knew that and purposed that. And now I'm dealing with this issue about Glossolalia and the church. God prepared me for this, too, for this moment. So I see and know your point of view, but you cannot fathom mine. Your path is religious and philosophical, while mine is spiritual and tested. <laughs> Amen. And so, and I continue to say, as regarding if scripture shapes my thoughts or feelings or vice versa, the answer is that scripture is the rule of faith. But context is context. A certain context does not delimit a gift of the Holy Spirit outside of that context, which is the mistake he's making in the scripture. For the church gathers to edify and be edified. It is simply understood that the gifts of the Spirit will and must be used for that purpose. However, this is not the only context for the gift of tongues. <laughs> so, yes, he's basing it on, on the verses, right? On the verse, and now he wants me to deal with the, the verse itself. So then I go into that. Let me see what the time is. And I'm going to do it. Because I think this teaching is important. I think you guys want me to continue here so I can just leave it at that. First of all, he says that the, uh, that, um, that, um, he says that what Paul says a lot 
are used metaphorically or things he's using metaphorically. He doesn't actually mean that you when that, that that you pray and when you speak in tongues you're praying to God. He doesn't mean that literally. That's just a metaphor. God, you know the problem is that you see who is fixing and arranging scripture here. Who's, who's making it fit in a different light than the way it's written? If that's the way he's talking, my point is, if, if, if he's using an allegory, he'll say it. What is the problem? I speak to you in, in metaphor, in allegory, or as Jesus used to say, in parable. Jesus would say it. Now we have to, to give, make other things that Jesus said a parable when he doesn't say that this is a parable, Right? This is the danger that people get into because they're trying to fix certain things that Jesus said, or in this case that Paul said, uh, and they fix it by saying, oh, he's talking as a metaphor here. It's not really what he's saying. So I say, listen, when Paul wants to speak in the word allegory, he knows how to say it. It's allegorio, right? Uh, and then in Galatians 4.24, giving the example, which things are in allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which generous to bondage, which is Agar. So Paul knows how to use the word allegory when he is teaching that this is an allegory. He uses it. He doesn't use it anywhere in 1 Corinthians 14, simply. And why, why shouldn't he say so if that's what he's doing? doesn't make any sense. Uh, so say 14... Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. The first thing that he says. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. That's what he said. He said, this is an allegory. Oh, I, I tell you a parable. He doesn't say that. He says, and this is the issue, that he's saying that you are speaking to God. For no man understandeth him, how be it, even though in the spirit he speaketh mysteries and when he when he's talking about mysteries he's not saying oh you're talking like uh, mysterious gibberish no he's saying that you're saying things that are mysteries church mysteries my, uh, spiritual mysteries these are deep s secret spiritual uh, utterings things are happening that's what he's saying okay very literally no metaphor here it's only a metaphor if you don't believe that the tongues are for the church, for whatever reason. But that is not a metaphor. That he is speaking that something's actually going on. As a Jew, Paul would be quite sacrilegious to use God when meaning a void, because the uh, this fellow said you. It's the same thing as saying you're speaking to a toilet, or you're speaking to the air. That's what he said. And so how is it that a Jew is going to use God in meaning toilet? It's ridiculous. I don't think these people even hear what they're saying. <laughs> so that's what he was trying. Yeah, and I said, see, or toilet as you put it. Because that was his comment uh, in a previous comment that he stated. As a Jew, Paul would be quite sacrilegious to use God when meaning a void or toilet as you put it that was shocking when he said it so you can you see that so instead of going to god he goes out he goes to the books he goes to the religious thing and then he says things like this i see a pattern here we have a pattern here houston there's something wrong here right so he's willing to go to you know even paul is as bad as he that we can even talk about God and be actually me referring to toilets. This is the mentality here. Just because you can't have speaking of tongues in the church. No, because when I did it, it was not from God. See? So who's shaping what? <laughs> he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. In comparison, which he does make with edifying, the same word, the church. So Paul makes no distinction between the effect or impact, only the beneficiary of it. See, now I'm breaking down the word, which he didn't do. He's just trying to read the word and make it say what he thinks it says. He's doing the same thing he did before, not knowing any better, right? 
and accusing all of us of doing the same. But we are not all the same, and we don't obviously read with the same level of comprehension. So it's not the same. If there were no benefit or true authenticity, he should have said so. Right? He should have said, hey, what you guys are doing is of the devil. It is no good. It is in the flesh. It is emotion. Paul would say the truth. He said it in other places. He will say the frank truth of the matter. He didn't you allegories and metaphors to tell you this is not good. Don't do this. He just tell you, don't do this. This is not... And this is not acceptable to the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord has me to tell you. He doesn't say that. So your metaphorical usage does not do that job well. You know, if there's something wrong with it, Paul would say so. I mean, he told Paul he was a hypocrite. He didn't have a problem telling Paul that, you know, hey, you're a hypocrite. He called Paul a hypocrite. And he can't call these people hypocrites here. You, you have to be kidding. You, know, you, you have to realize there's something wrong with your reasoning. Uh, you're trying to make it seem like these people were wrong in doing what they were doing. Totally horribly wrong. But yet, he's willing to tell uh, Peter that he's a hypocrite. He's not willing to tell these people, hey, stop doing that. It's wrong. See, I'm telling you, you're wrong. I have no problem with it. I would be that ye all spake with tongues. I would that you all speak in tongues. So why is he talking? Or okay, oh, that you speak in, 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 in languages. So now he wants to say that these tongues are really just languages. So then why don't you they speak in languages? What's the problem? But rather that ye prophesied. And what's the difference between the language speaking in tongues or languages and prophecy? That the prophecy is explained, it's, it's, it's interpreted, it's stated in your language, in the language of the group. That's the difference. Okay? So, according to uh, what people say out there, you're, you're speaking German and French and whatnot. But that uh, God, what you're supposed to do, just speak in the language of your local community. Right. So, for greater is he that prophesy, who, who speaks, right, in their own language, than he that speaketh with tongues. <laughs> that means in French or German. Yeah, it gets silly. It gets sillier from here. So is it so then we have God is not in favor of speaking a foreign language? You understand? It gets silly. Because obviously speaking in tongues doesn't mean speaking in a in, in a human language. That's not what Paul is talking about here. But he's distinctly talking about speaking in gibberish or in an angelic tongue. Because he's not calling it gibberish, it just sounds that way. Except he interpret that the church may receive edification, edify. Okay, so now as long as there's an interpretation, the gibberish stays. The gibberish goes. See, he's not denouncing the gibberish. It's just he denounces the fact that within the context of the church, we have this without a, an interpretation. If he interpret, then the prophesier is not greater the tongue speaker is, right? Because he's speaking a message directly from God. And I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna get into that a little second before I end. I got a surprise for you at the end. Okay. okay, so the context is what you are not really seeing here, but you will in the following verses. So what I did was go through the whole chapter and and take those words that Paul uses you know, about the speaking in tongues and and took away everything else because everything else is he's getting lost at confusing the context with the gift of tongues instead of uh, realizing that the, con the, the gift, the things being said is because of the context, not the gift of tongues. Some people don't get that. 
So it says here, I in the verse 18, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. That's what he said. 19, yet in, in the church, and I capitalize that, right here you see the context of this whole topic. It isn't a treatise on the gift of speaking in tongues. It is an instruction on that gift used in the church gathering. Context. It's in the church gathering. It's not everywhere and everything about the gift of tongues. It's just when you're... Like, look, verse 23. Because they say, oh, you're talking too much. Let's read what the words are. We'll read it. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place. Context. This is the same chapter. It's all, all talking about the gift of tongues. It's telling you the condition. This is called in science the condition. How is it then, 26, brethren, when ye come together, that's the context of verse 26. See, that's saying when you don't come together, when you're out there, when you're in your home, when you're praying by yourself in the countryside, he's not talking, when, when God moves you any place else, that's a different matter. But when you come together, that's what he's talking about. People are making a doctrine of the gift of tongues in general, everywhere, every and for all time. No, when you come together, is there tongue speaking outside church gatherings? So let's see. First Corinthians 14, 20, uh, is it, uh, verse uh, 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. That is what's, what the tongues are. Everywhere and every time, even in the church, except that you he rather that they prophesy so people can understand what's being said. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he is edifying himself. For if I if it was just gibberish, there's no edification. Now, there's some, some uh, truth in that if they're doing it for pride, you know, that other people see, I'm a spiritual guy, and I can speak tongues, then they are, they, in a sense, they, they are getting that benefit. But I don't know if it's called edification. You know, it, it, a better word would be something that says benefits himself. And I'll have to look, I haven't looked uh, for this explanation to see if that Greek word can be used for benefit. But in any case... That's the only real uh, po possible other alternative to taking that. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. Well, there is not about uh, getting, being proud, is it? See? So that's where this inconsistent. If that was being proud, how is this being proud that your spirit prayeth? It, it isn't. So that's why I tend to not accept that other one being that you're being proud and you're doing it to show off. I can't accept that because then uh, my spirit prayeth. Paul is saying that your spirit is praying. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. So I will gibberish, and I will sing, I will pray with the understanding, in English or Spanish, right? In German or in French. Whatever your language is, you do that, plus you pray in gibberish. And when you sing, you will sing in gibberish, and I will sing in English or German or French or whatever other language I am able to do, or that the Spirit gives me utterance. That's all it means. But he's going to do both. He's saying, I'm going to do just one. Now it says, I place that verse within, see, and so in 28, it looks like 28, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, in the church, context folks, and let him speak to himself and to God. So now again. We're going to speak to God? Why? Does God understand gibberish? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so again, there's a whole lot of people who call themselves Christian. I, I feel sad for them. 
but they really lack understanding. You're going to go and say that he's still talking about the toilet bowl here uh, and even putting God anywhere near some crazy guy who's speaking gibberish out of emotion. He'll go ahead, go and speak to God. He, he takes care of fools like you. We're going to be uh, talking here in English amongst us ourselves. It's ridiculous. Okay. I place that verse within the out of church section because it affirms the speaking of tongues otherwise. Yeah. Paul's final admo admonition, 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Okay? <laughs> so, because you guys don't understand what's happening. And basically, that's what's going on here. They, they don't understand what's happening. It doesn't matter that there's other people speaking tongues in other religious faiths and in, in pagan religions and drunkards are also speaking tongues and falling down. What did that matter? It, it, God still made them speak in tongues and fall down and shake and, and Acts 2. It don't matter. We, we're not going to run the church according to a pagan or anti-pagan things. Or we can't appear to be pagan. Why? Is it going to mean that we're serving another god? How many gods do you think are out there? I think that the most idolatrous people on the planet are Christian and Jews who think there are other gods. <laughs> and you're the ones talking about them. I never heard about other gods until a Jew or a Christian told me about it. That's the truth. Right? Because you guys keep bringing up these false gods that don't exist. God never made them. Why do you keep talking about them? <laughs> All right. So these verses establish the order for tongue speaking in the church. And that the gift of tongues is an authentic gift of the Spirit of God and should not be discouraged or forbidden. And so this is where I left it off uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, we're both busy, I'm sure, because I, I wasn't going to engage in this conversation. But that was four days ago. He hasn't responded yet because, I, you know, quite frankly... It's not easy. We already um, talked about uh, the fact that he admitted that the way he, he came into this, it wasn't of God. But he went the wrong way. And he went the wrong way because he doesn't have a personal relationship with God. I think that's one thing that he needs to come to grips with. And a lot of you out there need to come to grips with that as well. Okay, so I hope, I have to cut it short here, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope that this has been a help to you. I, I'm not sure what I'll do. I'm planning to travel for next week. I'll be away for two weeks or so. So I'm not sure if I'll be broadcasting live next week. If I can, I will, but I will not like advance into other things. I'll probably talk about this more for two or three Sundays if I'm able to get online. I will just simply focus on my experiences in God and the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues so that you, you guys have an insight that a lot of people don't have. So you guys can begin to understand that and uh, know why I know my Redeemer liveth. Okay? And the evening and the morning were another time period. Take care and see you next time. Uh, the Spanish part of this will be done later. So if I don't get to it, I'm already late with this. Um, I'll do it at another time and I'll, I'll bring it up in Spanish. So that's uh, for the Spanish speakers out there. Okay, goodbye. Uh, remember, uh, the last, uh, last chance, next Saturday, uh, well, not next Saturday, the two Saturdays, will be the conference advancing beyond atheism part two we are going to be in new york the adria uh, conference center hotel uh, this is for atheists and for theists people who believe christians and non-believers um, 
We answered the questions here. We killed atheism. No more atheism. And the only people who are still atheists are people who have not come to this seminar. Registration is required. It is absolutely free. See you there.